So good morning, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. So today, um, the message is about miracles, miracles in the Bible, and um, mainly about healing miracles, just to lay some foundations and some thoughts about their purpose. And there are many, many books written about miracles, so there's no possibility of covering everything today and um, even ever covering everything about them. So I'm just hoping to cover some basics. So first of all, what are miracles? Okay, and that's pretty um, simple. Um, they're extraordinary events or acts that go beyond um, the laws of nature and manifest God's divine intervention, intervention okay? And so it's just God's hand over nature in an extraordinary way, and often it's instantaneous. Okay, we see many types of miracles throughout the whole Bible. We see miracles of nature. Uh, think of the ten plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, Jesus calming the storm. There's miracles of provision. Okay, think of Elisha and the widow's oil. That's in 2 Kings 4. Uh, Jesus feeding the 5,000, the 4,000, manna in the desert. We see miracles of resurrection. Everybody knows about Lazarus, who Jesus raised from the dead. And also the man whose body was thrown on Elisha's bones who came back to life. That's in 2 Kings 13. And the widow's son at Nain that Jesus brought back to life. And then there's miracles of healing and deliverance, which there's plenty. Lots in the Bible. Uh, there's healing of the barrenness of Sarah, Hannah, and Elizabeth. Hezekiah's illness. Uh, we see blind receiving sight, deaf hearing, lame walking. And then there's others. There's uh, Elisha. Uh, he recovered the lost axe head in 2 Kings 6. He made an axe head actually float to the top of the water. And we see many supernatural deliverances in battle. We think of David and the Philistines and Jehoshaphat and 2 Chronicles. And um, I'm sure we could come up with many, many more categor categories. And that there were so many miracles in the Bible should be no surprise to us. Okay, we think about God, right? He's a supernatural being. And don't forget, these are just recorded miracles. So there's probably an awful lot more. Okay, and he's a supernatural being. He created the physical universe as well as the spiritual universe. So his domain covers both the supernatural and the natural. So his presence, by that his very nature, will bring the extraordinary into our physical world. And it is interesting, a few weeks back in our small group, we actually, that question actually came up about why Jesus does miracles. And um, the scriptures confirm the responses, so I'm going to share some of these today that we talked about. But first, I want to um, clarify the difference between purpose and outcome. So God says in his word in Isaiah 55, and I think many of you know this scripture, that his word shall not return to him empty, but it shall accomplish that which he purposes and shall succeed in the thing for which he sends it. And I suggest in a similar way that miracles are the same. They will accomplish God's purpose for which he does them. And I think that's very logical. I think we can all agree with that. But at the same time, I don't believe we can really perceive all of God's purposes. He knows the beginning from the end. We don't. But we can certainly make observations about the outcomes of these miracles. Okay, about what we see that they have accomplished. And that's what I'm going to do. But first of all, um, because I don't want to count, didn't want to count them myself, I googled how many miracles in the Bible. And uh, not surprisingly, I found many different answers. Uh, and I think that's because some people's definition of a miracle won't be the same as others. For instance, creation, some people say that's a miracle, some people won't. So um, the numbers that I found were as much as 163, and there could be some that say more, and as low as 125. And if you look at just the recorded miracles that Jesus did, you Google, I Googled that too, and most of them said about 37 or 38. And most of those were healing miracles, and some of which were actually hearing, healing miracles of more than one, okay? So, of course, I like math, so I did the math. And so anywhere from 25 to 40%, 45% of the miracles recorded in the Bible were done by Jesus. And that was in a period of only three years, his years of ministry. Now, that's really significant. So the rest were mainly before Christ came. And the ones in the Old Testament, they took place over about 2,000 years. So what am I saying? So there's a distinct concentration of miracles at the coming of Jesus. 
So why is this? So I mentioned earlier that God is a supernatural being, so we should be no, not surprised about miracles at all. So therefore, God's kingdom is also supernatural. So it's logical that there will be supernatural occurrences as his kingdom draws closer. So let's just go here. I have a few slides here. Let's get this right. Uh-oh. Wait a second. Press the up arrow. Should I point it at something? <laughs> I need a miracle. <laughs> Rob, I'll just go on a little bit. And just tell me when you're ready there. So Matthew 3.17, and that's at the beginning of Yeshua's ministry. Oh, is that it? Okay. Okay, we read. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Remember, the question is, why were there a distinct concentration of miracles at Jesus' coming? And when Jesus sends out the 72 to go ahead of him to preach in the towns, he tells them, this is in Luke 10, 9. Okay. <laughs> this is what Jesus says to them. He says, heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So he links these two together. Okay? He links the miracles, the miracle of healing, and the kingdom of God together. That's what Jesus did. Jesus is the king of the kingdom of God. So he brings the kingdom with him. So the kingdom was indeed near because Jesus, the king, he was right in the midst of them. Therefore, miracles reveal Jesus as the Messiah, right, as the king of kings. Now, how did the Jews at that time know that the miracles he did actually pointed to him being the Messiah? Why would they know this? Well, it was actually prophesied in the scriptures. <laughs> okay. Okay, so it was prophesied, Isaiah 35, 5, 6. And it says of the coming Savior, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. These miraculous signs, for those of them who knew the scriptures, which many of them did, they actually expected those to happen when the Messiah came. So they were looking for it. And we can look at what Jesus quoted about himself at Luke 4, okay, at the synagogue in Nazareth. You remember when he went to preach at the synagogue? He opens the scroll, and this is what he reads. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to declare the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolls up the scroll and says to the people, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus was quoting from Isaiah 61, and that speaks about the Messiah and the type of work he would do. So there's a definite link here to the performance of miracles, specifically the healing miracles and the identity of Messiah. Okay, we're going to look at some other links here. Okay, some other examples. This isn't just a one thing here. Uh, Matthew 8:16. You can actually, if you have a Bible, you can flip to them if you want. That might be easier right now. Okay? Matthew 8, 16. Okay, it says, it says, That evening they brought to him, that's to Jesus, many who were oppressed by demons. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Okay, now that word that Jesus, the, the fulfillment, is Isaiah 53, and it's referring to the Messiah. Again, a very clear link to healing miracles and Messiah. Another example, Luke 7.22. So if you want to turn to that. Luke 7.22. Now this is when John the Baptist was in prison. Okay, and, he, and he sends a messenger to Jesus to ask him if he, Jesus, is the one to come or if John should look for another. Now, Jesus doesn't always just say yes or no, and of course he didn't do that right now. Why didn't he just say yes? No, he replied this. He says, go and tell John what you hear and see. 
The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. So why is this a valid answer? And why would John actually understand what Jesus is saying? So if we look to the scriptures we just quoted, we talked about Isaiah 53, Isaiah um, 35, 5 to 6, about the blind eyes being opened and the, dead ear, the ears of the deaf unstopped, et cetera, et cetera. We know John knew the word, and therefore he understood completely what Jesus replied. Okay? By the works Jesus performed, his identity as Messiah was actually aligned with that prophesied in scripture. So Jesus was telling John, yes, I am the one to come. And people actually expected miracles to accompany the Messiah. Okay, John 6, 27 to 30. And this is the day after um, Jesus performed the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and fish to feed the 5,000. And he's approached again by some of the same crowd, and they ask about him. And referring to the beginning of Isaiah 55, which is all about the Savior, Jesus says, Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him God the Father has set a seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? I think that's pretty ironic that they asked that question, considering he just multiplied the loaves and fishes to feed 5,000 of them. But it does show that they were expecting great signs from the Messiah. Is this working? Oh, okay. That's okay. I'll just go on and I'll, I'll give you time to look it up in your Bibles if you want. So if Acts 2.22. Peter also acknowledges this link in Acts 2.22 when he's speaking to the crowd right after Pentecost. And he introduces his speech by saying, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through the, him in your midst, as you yourselves know. And then Peter goes on to speak about Jesus and the Messiah. So the wonders Jesus did attested to who he was and is, and the people recognized it. So I think these examples clearly indicate that miracles were an important witness to who Jesus was, his identity, and also his presence. So what else did miracles accomplish in the Bible? They revealed God's character and his person. As we talked about already, he is a supernatural being and is not limited by our physical world. He created the earth and all that is in it. He is Lord over all. And his nature is to bring life, to bring light, restoration, and wholeness. And he's just, too. He's just. Some miracles we see are due to judgment, okay, like the ten plagues or the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's long-suffering, and we know that mercy triumphs over judgment, but it doesn't mean that judgment will never come. But mostly, though, especially in the life of Jesus, we see miracles that reflect his love and his compassion. And we have to remember that Jesus revealed the Father, okay? In John 14, he says, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father, and in John 10, he says, I and the Father are one. He also says that he only does what he sees the Father doing. Therefore, the miracles that Jesus did not only revealed him as Messiah, but revealed the nature, the love and compassion of the Father. So, of course, we're going to look at some examples in Scripture of this. Because we don't want to just take it just because I say it. So, Matthew 20, 29 to 34. Matthew 20, 29 to 34. Okay, two blind men, they come up to Jesus, and they're pleading for mercy. And although the crowds, they rebuked him, Jesus stops, and it says, And Jesus, in pity, which is in compassion, touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. So Jesus showed his compassion. Another example, Mark 6, 30 to 44. Now, the apostles had just returned from having been sent out. Remember the 72 that went out? And Jesus tells them to rest, okay? And, but as they're going to rest, he sees this crowd of people running after him. And verse 34 says, When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like a sheep without a shepherd. He then teaches them, and he sees they're hungry, and so he multiplies a few loaves and fish to feed them all. Mark 8, 2. 
This is another miracle provision when the crowds have gathered to listen to him. He says, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. So again, he multiplies loaves and fish to feed the crowd out of compassion. Okay. So these examples of compassion also seem to have an another element in common of people coming to Jesus first, right, before receiving a miracle. So you could argue that people had to be seeking the Lord first in order for Jesus to do these miracles. However, I'm going to put to you one more example of this. Luke 7, 13. And Jesus and his disciples, they were entering a town called Nain. And as they were entering, they encounter a funeral procession of the only son of a widow. Okay, this is the, uh, she didn't have a husband, she was a widow, and this is her only son. Verse 13 says, And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. And then he goes and he raises the son from the dead. Now the widow and her son did not come to Jesus asking for any sort of miracle. They just happened to be in the right place at the right time. So the Lord's compassion, it's not conditional. Okay, that's just who he is. It is not conditional. So, and there's a very, another very positive result that actually came out from this miracle beyond that for the widow personally. Remember God's purposes, right? It's not just one-dimensional. So I'm just going to read on in the story there in Luke 7. It says, and he, that's Jesus said, this is he saying to the dead, the dead man, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has arisen amongst us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. So not only is this about the Lord's compassion, but also about manifesting his glory and initiating belief. Now we know about the first miracle that John records about Jesus, okay, in the book of John. That's where Jesus turns the water into wine at Cana. John 2.11 says, this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Glory and belief, both results from this one miracle. Now, is there another example of this connection between glory and belief to miracles that we can look at? Yes, of course. John 11, where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. When he first hears that Lazarus is sick, Jesus says, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. And we also know that many believed in Jesus as a result of this miracle. So just to review, let's um, sort of go over so far what these outcome of the miracles are, okay? Miracles witness to the identity of Jesus as Messiah, and therefore the presence of the kingdom. Miracles reveal God's nature and his character, they bring glory to God, and they inspire belief in Jesus as Messiah. Now, here I would just want to say a few things about healing miracles. Other than the fact that it was prophesied in Scripture as a witness to Messiah, why did Jesus do so many healing miracles? I mean, there's all types of miracles we looked at, but why so many healing mir miracles, healing and deliverance? So this is one of my own thoughts on this. Okay, I didn't read this in the Bible, but... Healing miracles I see as being very personal. They speak to the heart of individual people who receive it. They say that the Lord cares for them and understands their circumstances. He's not a distant savior, okay? But he w enters into the life of each person. So the healing miracles would have brought this home to every person affected, every person who got healed. It's personal and it's life-changing. But even so, in spite of this, they did not always pursue Jesus as their Savior. But their testimony would always go on to affect other people. Healing miracles go a long way to drawing people to Jesus, even if it isn't the person who was actually healed. So miracles did not guarantee outcomes uh, for all people, okay? Even though these miracles actually cause certain outcomes, they don't guarantee the same outcomes for everybody. So look at the Jewish leaders, for example. We talked about miracles inspiring belief, right? And witnessing to Messiah. 
The Jewish leaders knew about all these miracles, but they would not acknowledge Jesus as Messiah or give glory to God for them. And that's our reality today as well. Okay? There will always be people who will not be convinced, who will say they're just lucky, or they'll make up convincing theories, or they'll attribute them to other gods like positive thinking or creative energy, who will not give God glory for this work. But we know here, amongst us here, we know that God does miracles today, because we've heard of them, especially in, in um, places where the kingdom is just really advancing quickly, like in Africa. And some of us may witness these directly, although many of us don't see them too often. But here's a question that we often hear. Why do some get miraculously, miraculously healed and others not? Right? Is it about pers persevering prayer and just declaring the word of God for healing? Some exercise extraordinary tenacity in prayer and belief, but many don't get healed. Is it about having faith? Now, that's a tricky question because the answer, I believe, is yes and no. Because we hear of unbelievers receiving heal healing miracles. So for some, it's not about their faith. However, every healing, healing miracle I've read about and I've heard about seems to have that element of faith in it. Because either the one who receives, or the one who asks, or one who's just present, had a degree of faith in God and his ability to heal. So faith is present somewhere, and it is in God first and foremost. So uh, from observation, yes, I would say that miracles do require faith, but it's not necessarily in the person who requires the healing, who receives it. However, the opposite does not appear to be true. That is, faith in God does not seem to guarantee healing. Observation also tells us that the outcomes of miracles that we just finished looking at, those four outcomes, oh, right there, good, are not just a checklist, okay? So although we can check each one of those boxes for that miracle we are hoping and praying for, it may not come to pass. In the same way, there's not just one straightforward formula to do it. Jesus healed many, many ways, and sometimes he wasn't even present with the person. Most often, healing seems to be more of a process over time in which we clearly see God's hand at work. So all to say, I don't know why miracles happen for some and not others. But this is what I do know. Now remember what we said at the beginning, okay, that miracles are about God's plan and purposes, okay, Isaiah 55. And we are all a part of his purpose, and even if we can't understand it, we can trust and that he knows the best way to accomplish his goals, and that his purposes benefit all who belong to him, all of us. Remember the man born blind from birth in John 9? The disciples assumed incorrectly that blindness was due to his sin or the sin of his family. But God healed him. Why? He tells him. He says, Jesus says, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So oftentimes, God has a work to do at a certain time for a specific purpose we're just not going to see, we're not going to understand. And we know we're not going to lead a trouble-free life in this world, okay? John 3, 16, 33 tells us that. The Lord never promised that. But what I also know is that prayer is very powerful, very powerful. James 5, 16 says, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. The effective prayer of a righteous man has great power. So our prayers do make a difference. So never give up hoping and praying for a miracle. Okay, always looking first to the Lord, right? Trusting that he knows the best way to go. And remember that he is kind and loving and compassionate beyond our understanding. And just as Jesus, our Savior and our Healer, came bringing many sons, signs and wonders the first time he came as our king, our savior, our healer, and his reign come closer. We know it's coming closer. I believe we're going to be seeing many miracles happen again. Happen again. So be re ready for that greater glory to come. And now, Margaret, can I ask you to come up? And um, I'd like, if, if you're okay, to 
play that song on, that song again, Speak the Name of Jesus. And I'd like to ask if anyone has any ailments at all, any illnesses at all. Um, just put up your hand. It can be big, small. Okay, and I'd like some people just to go around them, near these people, if you're okay with uh, being close. Um, Marius, if you could uh, pray for Mike and maybe uh, just be around him. Anybody else who has any ailments? Uh, some people come near Andrea and Judy. Um, anybody else? Um, speak the name of Jesus. Okay, and just as we, as Margaret sings, I just like those near the people who put their hand up, everybody who uh, has someone near them to pray for them. And I just ask the people who are near them just to pray healing over these people. Okay, and those people online, I just ask you just to receive the healing of the name of Jesus as a song plays. Okay? I'm just going to take a few minutes. And if there's somebody you want to stand in the gap for, stand in the gap for them now, okay? And just get together and pray for, pray for these people. Okay. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom, I speak Jesus, your name is power. Shine through the shadows, 
burn like a fire I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over fear and all anxiety To every soul held captive by depression I speak Jesus We just ask you to seal the prayers today, Lord God, and we just believe that uh, we're one step closer to miracles in this place, Lord, because of who you are, because you are our healer, Jesus, Messiah, and there's nothing too hard for you. Thank you, Lord, and that is your heart. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.